Hello and thanks for joining me. I'm out for a ride today on my Harley Davidson. As you can see, it's a beautiful day. And I want to explore today the idea of Harley Davidson and freedom, this connection between Harley Davidson motorcycles and this concept of freedom. Now, this is going to be a serious talk, and I suspect it's going to be quite a long one as well. So if you're interested, then make yourself a cuppa, settle down, and ride along with me. One thing that I like to do is use my background as a, an academic social scientist to explore aspects of motorcycling culture. And many of my videos are about that and I have plans for many more in the future. And one thing which interests me as a British biker is that we have our own biking culture here in Britain, a very strong culture, but we have seen, as with many other areas of culture, uh, an influx or an invasion, if you like, of American culture, American biker culture, and that has come very much linked with Harley Davidson. And so that's what I want to talk about today. Harley Davidson and this idea of freedom, or what I you know, propose is this illusion of freedom that Harley Davidson sell. So let me let get into it because I'm going to have to take you through this uh, idea in, in steps and talk about a lot of the history and development behind where we are with the biking scene, the biking culture at the moment. So freedom is a concept that is widely linked with motorcycles generally and with Harley Davidson in particular. In fact, this connection with freedom is something which Harley Davidson carefully cultivate in their marketing and they have done so for many years. It's very hard to see any Harley Davidson marketing that doesn't either directly or indirectly push the idea that buying a Harley Davidson gives you freedom. The idea of freedom is fundamental to American self-identity, both for the individual and the nation. Uh, and so that's where this comes from, really. It's embedded within the Declaration of Independence of the USA as an inalienable right. And if you look at American history, the American Civil uh, War, uh, sorry, the American War of Independence was about establishing and defining the freedom of the USA, freedom from, from uh, Britain in particular. The American Civil War was also a struggle over freedoms. Uh, if Again, looking back in history, the USA uh, entered the Second World War, um, according to the speech given by the American president, to protect the four freedoms embedded within its constitution. And since then, uh, America has uh, participated in, in other wars, particularly the Cold War, was focused on protecting what the US see as an important aspect of the, the free world. The 1960s civil rights movement was about expanding freedom to all, regardless of race or creed. So in that very sort of short potted history, what I'm trying to point out is that the USA is in short, the land of freedom. And nowhere is this mantra uh, of freedom taken up and chanted with more fervor than among bikers. Um, Harley Davidson uh, has built over a hundred years of mar marketing on the notion that the motorcycle is the ultimate freedom machine. And just about every Harley Davidson advertising campaign, uh, uh, campaign ever run uh, has played around with some permutation around this idea of associating motorcycles with this American value of freedom. And the American biker image plays perfectly to the American ideal of the rugged, independent, self-sufficient individual who embodies this great American dream. The motorcycle is an iron horse. It's the romance-laden transport of the modern-day cowboy. Throw your leg over a Harley Davidson and you become John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. And so the argument that I'm putting forward today is that this is in fact an illusion. It's false. It's simply marketing hype. The reality is that the typical contemporary Harley rider 
He's far from free. In fact, just the opposite. So when you buy a Harley Davidson these days, you are buying into a very carefully cultivated commercial package. You're not achieving freedom. In fact, in most cases, you're achieving the absolute opposite. You're becoming even more deeply entrapped within the consumer-driven social compliance that bikers purport to be seeking freedom from. And this is a million miles away from the grassroots rebellion of the 1940s, 50s and 60s, out of which this image of the carefree, rebellious biker was born. So what has happened is that the image of the biker and the concept of freedom, which was born out of a, of a genuine rebellion against the constraints of society, it's been amplified by the media and then it's been appropriated by the capitalist machinery, and particularly the capitalist machine that Harley Davidson is these days, in order to sell motorcycles, riding gear, fashion clothes and, and motorcycle accessories to a customer who is simply buying into what the sociologists call a consumer tribe. In other words, the typical Harley Davidson owner is not achieving freedom, they're simply buying into the capitalist system and enslaving themselves even further to that system. So to explain my argument, I need to set out some of the history of how motorcycle culture has developed with particular focus on the USA because I'm talking about particularly about Harley Davidson culture and therefore USA culture. So have a look at how that has developed to the point where we are today. When motorcycles were first introduced at the start of the 20th century, they were very expensive and therefore regarded as a source of fun and adventure for the affluent and privileged classes. They were not regarded as a serious mode of transport. In the USA, Henry Ford's development of the very affordable Model T meant that motorcycles were not a viable alternative to cars as a practical means of family transport. However, after the Second World War, in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, the image of the outlaw biker was born. There were a lot of cheap ex-military bikes available and many young men returning home from war found it difficult to settle into the rather staid, buttoned-up society that immediate post-war era uh, you know, became. They, uh, uh, you know, these young men at war had experienced risk and danger and adventure and motorcycles provided a counterculture for them. Motorcycle clubs also provided a similar kind of fraternity to which these veterans had experienced in the military. And, and incidentally, I, I, I feel that is still the case today. So the, the classic image of the biker was also born in this area. Uh, out of the, the ex-military clothing and other cheap clothing that these riders used to wear such as leather jackets, the jeans and the boots, you know, what has now become this classic biker image. Now, I talk about the, the, the so-called outlaw biker image because that's how we regard it now, but back in the late 40s and the early 50s, most of these young men were law-abiding citizens. However, their lifestyle and culture was a threat to the paranoid Cold War society of the time, in which deviance of any sort was considered a threat to the domestic social order. It's important to note that bikers were only one of many groups re uh, re uh, viewed as a threat to post-war American culture. They were not alone in this. But f following the social theory that I set out uh, a, a moment ago, 
the, the next step of what has happened in the commercialization of the biker image was the way that this was taken up and developed by the media. And the most notable example of this was what happened at and following a gathering of around 4,000 bikers over the 4th of July period in 1947 at an American Motorcyclist Association sponsored race in Hollister, California. And this, of course, this event has now become infamous. At the, this event, some of the bikers got drunk and became rowdy, but it's generally now agreed that the level of trouble was played up by the media and was in fact nowhere near as much as it was made out to be. And uh, a now famous photo of a drunk biker with beer bottles littered around the ground around him, uh, this appeared uh, in, in the July uh, 1947 pages of Life magazine. Now, this photograph was posed in a deliberate, and you could argue successful, attempt to create fear among conservative Americans. It was used to confirm the belief that motorcyclists presented a threat to the conservative post-war uh, way of life. Uh, the photo uh, initiated a stereotype which has continued to this day. After uh, this Hollister event, uh, a short story about the takeover of a small town by a motorcycle gang uh, titled Motorcyclist Raid was published in Harper's Magazine in 1951. This story caught the eye of uh, a filmmaker called uh, Stanley Kramer who developed a, a fictionalised version of the Hollister Gathering resulting in the 1954 movie The Wild One. That film further confirmed the fears and stereotype that originated with the uh, Life magazine photograph. In, in the film, uh, Marlon Brando starred as a misunderstood, brooding and potentially dangerous biker. And the movie opened with a, a solemn warning. This is a shocking story. It could never take place in most American towns, but it did in this one. It is a public challenge not to let it happen again. So Brandon and his motorcycle riding buddies wreaked havoc and destruction on a, a small town and the film, the film was deemed so threatening that it was initially banned in, in some countries. Uh, so as a result of the Life magazine image, uh, the book that I referred to, and the film the, the Wild One, the stereotype of the outlaw bike image was created by the media. And this reputation was then enhanced by other less influential films of the era, such as, oh, there was The Motorcycle Gang, um, that was released in 1957, Drag Strip Riot in 1958, and probably one that you will probably know, The Hot Angel in 1958. So by the end of the 1950s, the print and film media had successfully created an image of motorcyclists as dangerous deviants who were an unmitigated threat to social order and common decency. Now, it has to be understood that this uh, stereotyping of bikers and the fears that it created took root in a paranoid post-war culture that was rife with fear of both internal and external spectres of communism. During this Cold War period, social and political conservatism was pervasive uh, and it was the dominant culture and conformity to those standards was expected and encouraged. So those who did not subscribe were considered suspect and motorcycle riders were deemed to be dangerous and non-conformist. The anti-communism of this area had two components. One focused on clearly defined international enemies of the United States, while the second focused less on national defence, but more on the perceived internal decay of American morals and standards. And this was a more uh, popularist 
war of ideas and ideology that was taking place within the USA. So one of the biggest impacts of the film The, Lion, the Wild One was how the leather jacket became a cultural icon that exemplified rebellion. The leather jacket in the wake of the Wild One became a, a reliable visual indicator that, be, that could be used to identify potential sources of trouble. And by the late 1960s, uh, a generation of, uh, of young people seeking ways to express their dissatisfaction with the conservative values of their parents often adopted the leather jacket. And in the 1970s and beyond, the stereotype associated with the jacket made its way into fashion consciousness of mainstream society, particularly mainstream American society, as an expression of real or imagined or faux rebellion. Also, the, the bad boy image of the biker was being amplified and distorted by the media. Um, there was, of course, some truth behind this. The, the 1960s saw the rise of, of outlaw biker clubs such as the Hells Angels and the negative press these groups got um, served to, to add to this image. Anyway, now back to the social theory. Uh, according to the social theorists, not only is the media involved in this cultural shaping, but also the government. So when the government began to show concerns about the activities and behaviour of motorcycle clubs such as the Hells Angels, the media jumped all over this and the result was a, a reinforcement of the public image of bikers being you know, dangerous outlaws. In the mid-1960s, the government of California, where the Hells Angels gained much of their early notoriety, they got involved in an investigation into motorcycle clubs. The former president of the Hells Angels Oakland chapter, Sonny Barger, commented in his uh, autobiography, if read it, uh, about how the, the government declared war on bikers. Uh, California's Attorney General, who uh, was a chap called Thomas Lynch, uh, asserted in 1965 that motorcycle gangs were comprised of, quote, unwashed thugs wreaking havoc on the highways of the state. So this government stance against motorcycle clubs and their members further advanced the biker image and contributed to the public's fascination with outlaw bikers and the, the Hells Angels in particular. And uh, Hunter S. Thompson's best-selling book, Hells Angels, added to the, this negative image. Now, although many reacted to bikers with fear, for some, motorcycles became a source of fascination because they represented freedom and rebellion. So some people look, maybe with a tinge of fear, but with a, with a spot of envy you know, from, from within the constraints and norms of a very buttoned-down society at the, you know, the freedom and, and the rebellion which bikers were experiencing. And it's interesting that there was a slight shift in this culture in the 1960s, and particularly in the late 1960s, um, during and after the, the Vietnam War, bikers took on a new image. And this is captured very well in the 1969 film Easy Rider. The film Easy Rider uh, left an indelible mark on the consciousness of the baby boomer generation many of whom identified with the characters played by Peter Fonda and Dennis Hopper. With this, this film, the unambiguous danger of the, the motorcycle gang member that was expressed in the 1950s and early 60s films was replaced with a, a slightly subtly different one. Uh, and it was the image of, of an uninhibited, peace-seeking, free-spirited rebellion that many members of the Baby Boomer generation found attractive. Um, you know, with non-violent hippies moving freely through the American landscape. And so among the young people of the time, I'm talking in the, the late 60s, early 70s, uh, motorcycles became less associated with antisocial criminality uh, and more with peaceful, carefree, rebellious, Abandon. 
Now, while the film didn't show the standard, you know, biker B-movie film formula, it, it portrayed motorcycle riders as a danger to the conservative values of mainstream America. And we saw this in, in the run-in, which, you know, the characters have with the sort of the local rednecks, which, uh, you know, ends up with their ultimate demise in the, in the film. But, but since the 1970s, um, motorcycling has achieved a, a cleaner, more social image. Um, and this particularly has been achieved through the marketing efforts of um, businesses like Honda, who brought a whole new image to motorcycling. So, also the media at this time then began to, to show motorcycling and motorcyclists in a more positive light through um, TV series such as Happy Days, you know, the, the Fonzie was, you know, shown as a, a, a you know, very um, respectable character. And of course, uh, Chips, the, the Chips, the California Highway Patrol which, which the, the bikers were, of course, the, the heroes. So these days, um, the biker image, and this is what I'm sort of bringing to, you know, how we've arrived at the current biker image. The, the current American Harley Davidson biker image is something that is sold by Harley Davidson. And it's, it's sold as, as a lifestyle that anybody can buy into when they purchase a Harley Davidson motorcycle or even perhaps just a Harley Davidson t-shirt um, most people these days who own and ride motorcycles are members of mainstream um, American society this is precisely why genuine outline uh, outlaw bikers call themselves one percenters because they represent only one percent of the motorcycling community the rest the, the other 99 percent are simply buying into if they do at all and certainly not all bikers do but those who uh, do are buying into this carefully packaged image that is being sold to them and so the the irony is that you know the modern day harley davidson which costs up to fifty thousand dollars in, in some cases are owned mostly by middle-aged middle-class men who are very deeply entrenched in the capitalist system most buy their bikes on, on a finance package the repayments of which keep them trapped within this this capitalist social system and so they, they simply pretend to be free and pretend to you know live this kind of out, outlaw biker type lifestyle for a few hours on on a sunday when they they wheel their motorcycle out of the garage for a short ride so my, my, my thesis of this talk then is that it is an illusion. Harley Davidson are not selling freedom, they're selling an illusion of freedom. Now, you may argue there's nothing wrong with that, and I'm not arguing that there is anything wrong with it. I'm simply just trying to do a social analysis of the bike culture in which we live. So I, I do hope, you've, if you've followed me this far, and I, I appreciate it's been a long video, uh, I do hope you found that interesting and thought-provoking. Thanks very much for watching. Hopefully see you again next time, right safely. Bye-bye.